um, uh, Anne had and had not done. Um, and uh, it was extraordinary to watch three judges leave the, the courtroom for about seven minutes if that, and, if even that, less, and yeah. then return to give a judgment which lasted at least 40 minutes. And the opinion of the public who've been present today is what we witnessed was a show trial and basically a pre-ordained outcome was just delivered to the public. The other clue to this is that uh, there's been a lot of people inside that court, all very quiet, well behaved, talking quietly, um, no problem at all. When we came out of the hearing, suddenly there's a lot of security people, and when we talked to one of those individuals, he said he'd been asked to come down, and obviously they, they, they oh, were sent because it was a preordained uh, outcome against um, Anne and Holly. So, 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 Brian, what you're saying is they, uh, they, they, they went out for seven minutes and they came back and gave their judgment over 45 minutes. What you're saying is that they had already made their mind up even before today. Of course, absolutely obvious. It was theatre. Uh, you, you, you cannot go through quite a detailed uh, case where, where a lot of information is being presented and discussed. You cannot then go out and, and come to a decision which takes you 40 minutes to deliver. Right. It yeah. must be preordained. So, in layman's terms, it's a show trial. It was a show trial in order to actually bring the mother and the daughter back into the family court system, where already the state has said that this. Uh, that the girl is vulnerable, the state needs to protect the girl, and of course, why is the state saying they need to protect the girl? Because ultimately the state wants to shut her up. Okay. In that court today, the central issue of the abuse, the rape and abuse of this little girl, was not addressed. Now, a young That's lady. All. It was not addressed. It I believe that one of the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators, was in court. Um, yes, in the first first session before lunch. We believe that's the case. Okay. Yeah. I can only say believe that's the case. Okay. But so if, if you actually analyse what has happened here, of course, there's no jury. We have three judges clearly setting out to support a fellow judge. That is obvious. And it wasn't just. The appeal is not upheld. The judge was highly critical of the family and what they have tried to do to protect Polly at the end of the day. Okay, Brian, I know it's early, early days, but what would be your advice to the people that are watching this? What can we all do? What can we all do to help Holly, to help uh, Robert Green, and to help um, Anne? Unless the public of this country wake up in sufficient numbers to get behind this case and to say no, we are not having the abuse of children condoned by the courts unless we get people in vast numbers to stand up and be counted this case this court case sets a precedent that the state can take any child from anybody without any evidence or other cause we are very very close to a Soviet system where children can simply be taken away and if the parents dare to complain they will be put in psychiatric units as the mother has already been. And the fact that today with this case there's no media, there is no BBC, there are no cameras tell you that in Britain 2012 we are watching a judicial system which is utterly corrupt. Running amok. And I am going to use this occasion to say that John Hemming MP has been brave enough to stand up on a stage in public and be filmed saying that in his opinion as an MP the family courts are utterly corrupt and he has called for the head of the family law division to stand down. So now we have MPs admitting that the judicial system in this country is not only corrupt, many of us are now totally convinced that it is so corrupt it will act to protect paedophiles provided they are people of status in, the, in society. If you are somebody at the bottom end of the social spectrum and you are caught being a paedophile, the state will throw everything against you. If you are at the upper echelons, and you are hidden amongst the senior police, judiciary, military, 
whatever the state will protect you. Brian, if I could just interrupt you. When you were talking about the BBC, ITV, etc., the national media not reporting this story, what I have to tell you is that there were three Sky News teams outside. They're waiting for Ryan Giggs. They would not, even with all these people there, they refused to report this. Yeah. So, so, what, so what, I'd like to just back up what you just said. The national media, they are not putting this across in many other cases, Brian. Well, what we've got to do now is start asking the questions of the media. It's not enough to say the BBC will not report. We need to say who are the people in the BBC who are stopping this. We need their names. We know, need to know who they are and we need to bring them into the public domain. Let's not, let's not try and expose an organisation blandly called the BBC. Let us identify the people who are protecting the paedophiles by not reporting what's going on. Well, the, BB, the BBC, Brian, uh, you know, risk of uh, teaching my granny out to suck egg, eggs here, yeah. they are taking £3.4 billion pounds from the, the, the license payers of this country yes. every year and they do not represent us, they represent a minority. Absolutely. And I suggest that the BBC, if you don't pay um, your Sky bill, they close you down. If you don't pay your television license, they'll take you to court. Yep. That is state-run TV Absolutely. and that brings us back to the communism that you were talking to that seems to be practising and all these people, all of us people in this country, they are doing something to us that is taking away our freedom of speech and there are good people still here. Well, We've got them around you at the moment. Brian. Well, the, the thing I will say is that the attack is on all of us. It doesn't matter what status you are, it doesn't matter whether you're professional or unemployed, it doesn't matter whether you are black, white, Muslim, Christian. This state is now attacking its own people. And it is obvious that people in Parliament not only know what's going on, they are part of the child abuse system. We have recently written to Sarah Tether, Families and Children's Minister, and we asked a simple question. When it says in your responsibilities that you are responsible for marketing and commissioning of children's services, we simply ask, what does that mean? It sounds like commercial exploitation of children. She will not answer the question. She has not answered a freedom of information request. She has gone silent. And let's not forget, I'm not now talking about Conservatives or Labour, we're talking a Lib Dem, a Liberal Democrat MP who is hiding to cover up her involvement with what is happening with children. We know from experts amongst the public here that Kent County Council has spent over £100,000 effectively trafficking British children out of the country we know that the total amount of money that barristers and law firms are making from children's cases is about £20 billion pounds a year. Unbelievable. This is massive. And if anybody says to me, David Cameron does not know what's going on, he absolutely knows. Absolutely. Well, I, um, can, can I interrupt yeah, you again? I actually um, had uh, uh, captured, if you like, um, Nick Clegg just before the election. And I said to Nick Clegg, what are you going to do about institutional paedophile rings that are operating in this country now? He said, I don't know what you mean by institutional. Absolutely, because they will deny everything. They cannot look at the evidence because if they they look at the evidence, they're hung by their, their own baton. Okay. Okay, get this guy. Here we come. Okay, God bless you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Can I just say, welcome to the Gestapo. Here we have the general public being thrown out of their own court. It is extraordinary, isn't it? Extraordinary. Yeah, all these people here, and now we have three officers. Okay. Let's hear it for Brian Gary. Of course, can we hear it for Holly Gregg and Brian Gary yes. and Robert Green and Holly Gregg? Yes. 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 Yes.
Thanks very much for the call. You're welcome. No problem. Bye. All right, folks, uh, 15 minutes left in the, sh in the show. If you would like to get in touch with us here in the studio, give us a ring in the last 15 minutes. Myself and Robert Green here in the studio. Uh, 0161 202 1677. That is 0161 202 1677. And as I was just saying, please go to that Facebook group page. There are 12,000 members and growing. And, of course, the that group was actually taken down by Facebook last week and then it was reinstated. Now, I'm not sure, obviously, of the politics that went on behind the scenes, but someone had it pulled and someone reinst uh, reinstated it there. So go to Facebook. Uh, we won't allow the state to cover up the Holly Gregg pedophile scandal. 12,000 members right at, right at the top there. You have a link, which I have just posted this very second, and it is the full audio of all the interviews which you have heard with Anne Gregg tonight. All right, then coming up before the end of the show, we're going to actually have two minutes of an interview I did with Holly Gregg herself. Of course, Holly has Down syndrome, but she's still a very clever girl, and she's still able to answer some of the questions I put to her, and uh, it's, it's heart-touching, heart, it's heart so just listen up for that. Uh, but right now, we're going to go to the last little part. It's only one minute long, and this is just where I asked Anne Gregg what she would like to see done uh, about this whole affair. What would you like to, to see happen in the future regarding everything from... Your brother's death to Dennis Mackey to um, Holly. What would you like to see in the future in an, in an ideal world? In an ideal world, I want everyone brought to book. I want this whole thing to be thoroughly investigated. I want all the, the, the bodies that have written documents, uh, you know, and lied to be held to book and, you know, someone to be held accountable for all of this. Because this has destroyed my daughter's life and my life. And how many more little boys and girls are maybe having to go through that right now? And in your opinion, the Scottish legal system has let you down dr drastically? As far as I'm concerned, it's rotten to the core. Absolutely damning uh, interview there with Anne Gregg. And thank you so much to Anne for doing that with me. I know that it took a lot of courage and... We're talking about such sensitive information here and she was very forthcoming and uh, hopefully you enjoyed listening to that tonight. That was the last part of that interview. But as I say, it is available online on Facebook. Uh, we won't allow the state to cover up the Holly Gregg pedophile scandal and it is on there now if you want to go and listen to that. There are 10 minutes left. If anyone else out there would like to get in touch on the phone, we'd really like to hear from you. 0161 202 1677. We've got a call coming in now. Manchester Radio Online, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, it's David again here. I was on here. I was actually beat up by one of my cr the criminals in Aberdeen here, and I find it very funny that Holly got all this money. Because when I was beat up, it took the police five weeks to go along and get hold of this guy. Then when I applied for criminals' injuries money, they, had, they wrote to Grampian Police seven times over a two-year period to ask if I had a criminal record, which I don't have. A... So we're delaying and delaying and delaying the case. I had a crime file number, I had photographs of the injuries, I had doctor's reports, and I had so much difficulty that money with all that got reports and evidence, yet I'm good at with no crime file number. This is really, really funny. So basically, you, you, were, you were a victim of crime, you got no money. And I got they, money, but it, it took me two years. Yeah. yeah. And uh, do you think it's suspicious that uh, Holly has been given this money when they still say that there's no crime being committed? That's it's very funny because I had to have doctor supports, I had the police support, I had the crime file numbers, they, had, they accessed all my medical records. Uh, in, when the Criminals Injuries Compensation Board, I put in a letter to my doctor, a mandate, giving them access to my medical records. On, after I signed it, I put down in the bottom of the letter, only my medical records from the time of the assault. I then found out that my doctor had given all the medical records to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. I went along there to find out why, and he showed me the letter. The Criminal Injuries Compensation Board removed the part underneath my signature. It said only my medical records from the time of my assault. So the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board removed that, and they accessed all my medical records. Well, uh, David, we, we appreciate your input tonight, and we know that you've... Uh been on the brunt of a lot of uh, wrongdoings from Grampian Police, so we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. No worries, sir. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, then. Uh, just under 10 minutes left in the show. Going to go through a couple of emails now. Uh, this one is, I think it's from Steve. It says, Hi, I have emailed several prominent people in Scotland, including Alex Salmon, but I've heard nothing back. I did, however, receive an email from George Galloway, and he said he was looking into the case. 
A few days later, the Palestine Telegraph picked up the story. God bless Holly and Robert and all who are trying to get this story out. Thanks, Steve, and I uh, appreciate that there, uh, Steve. Uh, also, let me see what we've got here. Uh, great show tonight. It's about time the general public stood up to be counted. We do have a voice, and I couldn't agree with you more with that. This story is about this. The story about this is going global. No one will silence the campaigners. This spreads further than Scotland. It's rife. Robert Green is not alone in speaking out. Over 12,000 people in the field. This isn't going to go away until there's a proper investigation. Why hasn't there been a revolution already? Maybe it's coming. That's from Benny. Thank you so much for that e email, Benny. And that's great words of encouragement to myself and Robert. Robert, would yes. you like to comment? Yes, I would, Bert. Thank you very much, Benny. That was wonderful what you've had to say. And uh, let's hope that we can get a lot of people working together. I would uh, just like to say at this point to you, Benny, and everyone else who's listening, that it ha certainly hasn't been a solo effort on my part. Uh, there's been a number, right from the start, there's been a small number of dedicated, brave, and highly intelligent people who have all helped in many, many ways. So um, I'd just like to thank them very much publicly for all the help that they've given and continue to give in this case. Going back to this uh, Facebook group page, uh, it's on fire at the moment, and it's, on, it's been on fire for quite a while now, as long as I've uh, known about it. Uh, loads of people already picking up the podcast uh, of tonight's show. It's not the podcast of tonight's show, as it were. It's more 30 minutes exclusive interview just with the original interview I did with Anne Gregg, which is split up into like 10 parts, and we played it on the show tonight. So we're almost out of time. What we've got to play now is uh, a, a, the actual recording of an interview I did with Holly Gregg herself. Now, folks, uh, we've been talking about Holly all night long, so this is... Uh, Kind of little little chat I had with Holly uh, a bit earlier on in the week. Turn your radio up, listen to this. What would you like to see to happen to your dad? I want to say enough, enough, enough. <laughs> I'm a headache. No more daughter anymore. What would you like to happen to daddy? He's in jail. In jail? You deserve to be in jail? Yes. Yeah. And what about the other people? What, what do you think? Do they, do they deserve to be in jail too? Yes, a whole lot. Do you miss your Uncle Roy? Yes. And what, what do you think? Do you think? Do you remember the day that your Uncle Roy caught your dad with you? Yes. What do you think Uncle Roy said to your dad? It, do you dare to bring her again? Can <laughs> Yeah, can you remember the people that was doing things? In Helen's house. In anyone else's house? Yes, uh, Sylvia. In anyone else's house? In Wynn, Evelyn. And was your dad there every time, or was sometimes you there on your own? Yeah. You were sometimes there on your own? Yeah. And would your dad bring you there and then go away? Yeah. And your carer would take you to someone's house and leave you there? Yes. And, and when you were there, bad things would happen? Yes. And then would your dad come back and pick you up? Yes. What, what, what would you like to say to anyone? You know, some people have set up the Facebook group. You know, some people's on the internet trying to raise awareness and trying to get justice for you. What message have you got for them? Thank you. That's, that's, I'm sure a lot of people will be glad to hear that. And do you appreciate and you know that people, this is a message from me and everyone else that's trying to help you, that we're just saying that we support you and we're going to do all we can to get justice for you, right? Yes. You're a very brave girl. Yes. There you go, folks. Deep stuff. That was Holly Gregg herself speaking to me a bit earlier on in the week. We're pretty much out of time. Robert, anything you would like to add before we go? Uh, very little, apart from thanking everybody so much for all your support. And you, you've got two wonderful ladies there, Holly Gregg and her man. They really are terrific. They deserve every support that can be given to them. And uh, I do thank you all for your kindness and your good wishes and your bravery as well. Thank you so much. And on behalf of everyone listening, and myself, Robert, uh, good luck with everything. Good luck with your court case. 
and uh, hopefully they don't come after you again. And uh, I mean, to an extent, you do encourage this court case because it'll just highlight the case further. Well, it will, yes. <laughs> I bring but, it on, is what I say. <laughs> but hopefully, you don't have to see the inside of a cell again because that is a uh, oh, definitely. Keep my fingers crossed, Tony. <laughs> don't, don't say that. Yet. We haven't been outside yet. We <laughs> no, don't Paul. Any, any police waiting for us out there? No. <laughs> Uh, we'll send somebody to check. We've got a couple of bodyguards here. We'll be all right. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much to everybody who's got in touch. The MSN has been packed out tonight. The phones were busy. Thank you to everyone who got in touch through the email as well and, and the Facebook. And, uh, yeah, just thank you very much, Robert Green. Thank you very much indeed, Tony. And thanks for doing a great show and helping to highlight these things. We wish people had as much courage as you have. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right, then, folks. I'll be back again next week uh, with more stories to tell and more shocking things needing uncovered. Jim lives in Texas. He's come all the way over from Texas. He's, um, this, is, this is the description Ruth's written for me. Jim Mars from Texas is a distinguished, award-winning investigative journalist and author who specialises in conspiracy-related subjects. His journalistic career was kick-started after he completed his service in the Vietnam War. Joining the Fort Worth Star-Telegram as a reporter, he soon became the newspaper's military and aerospace writer. <laughs> Among the subjects that Jim investigates are the JFK assassination plot, and he's even taught a course at the University of Texas for 30 years on the JFK assassination cover-ups. He's also done a course on UFOs at the University of Texas. He's done a lot of research into military-funded remote viewing and psychic spying. He's done a lot of research on 9-11 secrecy and, of course, the war on terrorism. He's the author of a book called Crossfire, which was the book that Oliver Stone's movie JFK was based on. He's written Rule by Secrecy and another one called The War on Freedom. He's written Inside Job, The Terror Conspiracy, and uh, both of those are about uh, the 9-11 cover-ups. He's also the author of Psy Spies and Above Top Secret. Uh, Jim has contributed several articles on these subjects to Nexus over the years, ranging from the war on terrorism to UFO sightings by US astronauts. Jim is a great raconteur, a fedora-wearing character, and a mine of information about inconvenient truths that the elite controllers would prefer never saw the light of day. This is his third appearance at a Nexus conference, second one in Australia. You appeared, I think, at our conference in Amsterdam a few years ago. And um, so please give him a big warm welcome back to Australia to our Nexus conference, Jim Barr. Thank you, Did he say I was extinguished? <laughs> okay, got a long way to go and a short time to get there, so I'll try to just move right into it. But first, I think I have to preface my remarks by letting you know that um, uh, once again, I'm on the cutting edge. I, I seem always to be just a little bit ahead of the time. Sometimes I get a little ahead of myself. Um, back in the 60s when it was considered impolite to even talk about the Kennedy assassination in public, I was saying, hey, it was a big conspiracy, okay? So I was the conspiracy theorist and the nut. Um, in the early 70s, I was saying Richard Nixon is a crook and he will not serve out his second term. And uh, by the way, Vietnam is already lost. We're just going to lose there. We might as well just get out now and save lives. And of course, I was the conspiracy theorist and the nut and probably unpatriotic. Uh, it all proved to be true, of course. <clears throat> 
uh, and it just comes right on up uh, to 9-11. And we are now in the same situation with 9-11 that we were for 15 years after the JFK assassination, which is, at least in America, it's considered impolite to just even bring that up and talk about it, uh, you know, in decent company. Uh, but I'm here to tell you just flat out with no fear of contradiction that 9-11 was an inside job. Okay, uh, it's just, and that, what makes it all the more horrendous is that uh, we are now still engaged in bloody warfare in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And what's the precedent for that? 9-11. Well, if 9-11 was a fraud, then we're fighting these wards on fraudulent basis. Uh, it's just incredible. And of course, the, but you can't say that because once again, I'm just the conspiracy theorist and uh, the nut, and again, possibly unpatriotic. Uh, but uh, we'll cover that a little bit more in detail. So uh, I've always been just a little bit ahead of the game, and today I'm ahead of myself here in Australia because I'm going to tell you about my latest book, The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, How the New World Order, Man-Made Diseases, and Zombie Banks are Destroying America. Um, the good news is that uh, this book was released for publication on June the 29th, all right, just uh, two, three weeks ago. Uh, the further good news is, as of last Sunday, it had already reached number 16 on the New York Times bestseller list. All right. The bad news is that it is so recent that I was unable to get any copies down here to Australia. So, man, nah, 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 you can't get any. Uh, I am so sorry. But anyway, I'll give you a little preview, and then you all can watch for it, because I'm, I'm very confident that uh, within a few weeks or, or months or however long, uh, you will be able to get the Trillion Dollar Conspiracy down here. So, moving right along. There's the cover. And uh, I'll tell you a quick little story. When they sent me the first rendition of the cover, it was exactly as you see here, except for the graphic. The graphic was a big picture of George Washington as he appears on the $1 U.S. bill. And I wrote him back immediately, and I said, you know, why are you laying this off on poor old George? <laughs> George didn't have anything to do, you know, with what's going on right now. I said, if you want to uh, really present a picture of what's going on, use the other side of the $1 bill where we have the great seal. Uh, yeah, look, I think I can use this right up here where we have the words Novos Ordo Seclorum, which uh, when I was a kid they told us meant the new order of the ages. But Novos, of course, is new. Ordo means uh, uh, order. And seclorum uh, is, comes from the root word, Latin, that where we get the word secular, which means the material world, okay? So you can translate it as new world order. And uh, this, and then you can see the mysterious, all-seeing eye of the pyramid, uh, the thirteen steps. This is very Masonic, um, and that's uh, another thing too. Um, I'm going to encourage all of you. Uh, I was actually, I'm going to tell tell myself I wasn't really aware that I was supposed to make two talks here. So uh, tomorrow, uh, Duncan put down that I'm going to talk about 9-11, but I'm going to cover the high points of 9-11 pretty much today, and then maybe a little bit tomorrow. But tomorrow, uh, yeah, tomorrow, I would encourage you all to, to c come see my presentation because I'm going to shift it a bit, and I'm going to show you a little presentation called Hidden History. And I'm going to go all the way back to Atlantis and bring it forward to Barack Obama and show you who's who's been doing what and why, okay? So I encourage you to see that. The new book, The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, touches on the financial meltdown in the United States, and of course that has ripples all around the world. What caused this crash? Liars loans, bad food and water, Codex Alimentaris. If you don't know about that, you better find out because they were working very hard to take away your vitamins. Uh, if they get their way working uh, around, you know, making an end run through the United Nations and their Codex Alimentarius, uh, you're 
you're going to find that you're going to have to go pay a doctor to get a prescription to get vitamin C. Uh, biological weapons and how that man-made diseases are now debilitating the entire human population. Drugging the population. Swine flu hoax. If you remember this time last year, <gasps> we were all scared to death. The swine flu is going to get us, you know. Of course, I had already figured out the uh, solution to swine flu. You know, you, you take an ointment. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I, I said I had a lot of them. I didn't say they were any good. <laughs> Dumbed down education. Uh, and I, I'm sure this holds true in Australia as well as the United States. In fact, I will apologize in advance. Most of this talk, most of the things I'm talking about were geared towards, uh, of course, what's happening in America. But I feel very certain that, number one, you guys, and I tip my hat to every one of you because just the sheer fact that you're here shows me that you've got an open mind, open ears, and that you're, you want to learn, you want to know what's really going on. And uh, I'm sure you can find something that uh, I'm talking about that's mostly pertaining to America, but that you can also and equally apply here in Australia. And while I'm on it, I, I just feel great to be back in Australia. I love Australia. And despite the winter weather, <laughs> weather, weather, <laughs> I love it. In Texas right now, it's like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? And so this is, this is heavenly to me. I love it. You, I, everybody I'm running, oh, I'm cold. You know, you're cold. You don't just, is it cold? This is great. Uh, I, stood, I started to go swimming yesterday until my common sense got the better of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably, I'd probably freeze, stiffen up, and then I'd be shark bait, right? But I, I appreciate being here. I appreciate seeing all of you, and thank you all for coming out. And you have my utmost respect and honor because, simply because that I know that each and every one of you, in your own way, are, are trying to find truth and trying to find out what's really going on. And in the same token, let me say, don't believe a word I say. Okay, I'm not asking for your belief. I'm not a politician. I'm not an evangelist. Okay, so I'm not trying to tell you that I've got it all. Listen to me. You know, I, I got a direct conduit with God. Nah, I just study. I got a good classical education. I'm not stupid. I'm well read. I got my eyes and ears open. I got lots of contacts. My wife says that I'm a information magnet. But, because every day I get literally hundreds of emails from all around the world, from Europe, yes, even Australia, all the places, and they all send me these stories, you know. And it's stuff that normally I probably would miss, but uh, here they all come. So I correlated all, try to figure out what does all this mean, try to connect the dots. And I'm here to tell you what I know and what I've learned, and you can... Take it or leave it, okay? Because I'm not a revolutionary. I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. I'm trying to give you information and then try to encourage you to use that God-given computer you've got up here and figure out where the truth is, what's really going on, and then I would uh, exhort you to act on it. Because, folks, the time has passed for us to just go, well, gee, that's interesting, and sit around and think about it, you know, uh, because that's what we've done for the last 40, 50 years, and you can see where it's gotten us. Once you figure out what the truth is, once you figure out what needs to be done, then by golly, get out there and try to get something done about it, okay? Uh, so let's move right along. You've heard about the tea parties in the United States. Uh, you have not been told the truth. The Tea Parties are in every state. The solid tax-paying Americans are extremely upset with what's going on. And I think you're going to see a real shift come November and the off-presidential year elections. And yet the media, which is under total corporate control, tries to downplay this. And then also the party political system, Republicans, Democrats, and they're both controlled by the same people as you'll see, they try to uh, have tried to co-op 
the Tea Party movement, which is truly a grassroots movement. And they've tried to co-opt it by trying to bring in Sarah Palin and these various people. Oh, well, yeah, we're all for this and try to shift them into voting Republican, you know. Well, you know, we just got through having 10 years of a Republican and all it did was get worse. So uh, it's time in the United States to forget party politics. And I would su submit to you that in Australia it's, it's probably the same thing. Forget the party politics and start looking for the politicians who will look out for you, not for their party or not for their philosophy. Benjamin Franklin wrote, the colonies would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment and dissatisfaction. This is extremely important for you guys to understand. Money is the key to the whole thing. Money is the control mechanism. And as he said, I was taught in school, and you probably have been taught too when it comes to the American Revolution, oh, they fought it over that tax on tea. Uh-uh, no way. They fought because their money was taken away. The colonies were issuing what was known as colonial script. And this was issued through the various colonies, and it was based on the available uh, work, labor, and and services, and they were prospering because the money was solid. It was backed by something, okay? And they did not have to pay interest on their money. Well, of course, this did not sit well with the financial powers of Europe, namely the Rothschilds, and Baron Rothschild, of course, controlled the Bank of England, so they twisted the arm of the royals, and they had King George pass a, approve a law, and it was passed in Parliament, that made colonial script illegal. You had to deal in Bank of England notes, interest-bearing notes. And this was the cause of the revolution. And others through history have certainly understood this. Lenin said, the surest way to destroy a nation is to debauch its currency. Uh -huh. Well, we see that happening in the United States, and I venture to say it's also happening in Australia. He also said, give me four years to teach the children, and the seed I've sown will never be uprooted. So if you can condition the children to think in a certain way, to believe that socialism is the wave of the future, the way to go, then by the time they get to high school, they're already caught. They can't think in any other way. So going back again, uh, the United States tried to, one of the biggest bones of contention since the revolution and the founding of the republic and the constitution was the question of whether or not we should have a central bank. Well, they tried it. Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson were the two opposite sides of the coin. Uh, Jefferson said, you know, banks are worse than standing armies. Hamilton said, no, the rich people, they know how to handle money, so they should be in charge. And this was a big contention. So they actually, thanks to Hamilton, tried the uh, Bank of the United States and then the Bank of America. They tried twice, uh, three times actually, to have a central bank. And each time the bank was corrupt, the bank charged exorbitant interest rates, and the bank was responsible for uh, farmers falling into debt, losing their farms, etc., etc. And, of course, by the 1830s, uh, Andrew Jackson, the first president born west of the Mississippi, said, that's it, they're a den of vipers, and he did away with the uh, central bank. For his trouble, he was, they tried to impeach him, and he, but he missed being impeached. Now, think about that. He gets impeached because he was shutting down a central bank. Bill Clinton gets impeached because he's having sex with an intern. Jeez. How, have we, we, how far we have come. Okay. So... So, for, all through the late 1800s, uh, there was no central bank. I also might mention that uh, twice in American history, two American presidents have tried to issue their own currency, not through the Federal Reserve System or through the international bankers, but 
by issuing it through their own Treasury Department, and one was Abraham Lincoln, who said, in effect, that uh, issuing money was one of the key privileges of government, okay? So he issued greenbacks, uh, non-interest-bearing notes, to finance the war between the states. The other president was John F. Kennedy, who in June of 1963 issued $4.2 billion in United States notes. I have one, I have a couple of examples of this, of a $5 bill that was United States note. It's got red ink on it. It does not say Federal Reserve note. It says United States note. This was money issued through the Treasury Department. What's the difference? $5 is $5. The worth of it is not uh, any different. The difference is that through the Federal Reserve System, you have to pay interest on the money. You issue the money through the Treasury Department, you don't pay interest on the money. And if you know anything about finances, you understand that the biggest bulk of the yearly budget of the United States goes to, quote, retire the national debt, which is a fancy way of saying paying interest on the money we owe. And I don't think that it was some sort of coincidence that both Lincoln and Kennedy were shot in the head in public. This is what happens when you mess with the moneyed people. We got the Federal Reserve System through this man, Paul Werberg, a German banker who came to the United States and participated in 1910 in the meeting at uh, J.P. Morgan's hunting lodge on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia, where he met with the big bankers, and they said, we've got to uh, set up a system. And he, they said, but we cannot call it a central bank. So what emerged from that and was finally passed into law on December the 24th, Christmas Eve, with most of the Congress away for holidays and everyone clearly distracted by Christmas, and they rammed through the Federal Reserve Act in 1912. This created the Federal Reserve System. Now, the way it works is pretty simple. Congress authorizes debt. Congress says, okay, we need more money, so let's issue another $100 million. So then once they authorize this debt, then the Federal Reserve System spends a few hundred bucks on paper and ink and prints up a hundred million dollars and distributes it out through the country, through their 12 regional banks. Now they turn around and charge the government. Do they charge the government for the few hundred dollars they spent on the paper and the ink? No. They charge the government for a hundred million dollars dollars and we have to pay the interest on it that is it's just nuts and here he is as head of the first federal reserve uh, board of directors now what's interesting is is that as war clouds gathered in 1915 16 and 17 came and the united states got involved in world war one it was Paul Warburg, the German banker, who was put in charge of loans and of war bonds and of the finances for World War I. Meanwhile, in Germany, his brother, Max Warburg, here he is, was head of the Warburg Company, principal stockholder in Germany's Reichsbank, which was financing the German war effort in World War I. Max Barberg also was a co-founder of IG Farben, and I don't have to tell you that IG Farben at that time was the largest chemical combine in the world and went on to become one of the major foundations for Hitler and the Third Reich. It was also Max Warburg who, operating in a capacity as an intelligence chief in Germany, helped arrange the sealed railroad car that passed through wartime Germany and took Lenin into Russia to take over the Russian Revolution for the Bolsheviks, which became the communist. The theological head of the communists was, uh, uh, was in Trotsky, was in New York working on, for Wall Street capitalists and living on Rockefeller land rent-free. He then was sent by Joseph Schiff, another big Wall Street capitalist, with millions of dollars and a boatload of revolutionaries to Russia again to take over the Russian Revolution and change it into communism. 
Interestingly enough, the boat was stopped in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and the Canadian authorities said, wait a minute, we know you, and we know that you've already made publicly stated that you're going to Russia, and you're going to take Russia out of the war, which is going to free up millions of German soldiers to come over to the Western Front and face our Canadian boys. We're not going to let you go, so they impounded the ship. Well... The American president, Woodrow Wilson, said, no, no, wait a minute, Here, here's a passport. He's acting as an American under the protection of the American system. And Winston Churchill, who at this time was Lord of the Admiralty, said, no, no, that's all right, let him go. So what I'm telling you is these globalist financiers created communism in the East, in the Russia. And I think the game plan was to create a socialist East, pit it against the capitalist West for conflict that would result in maximum control and profit. It got sidetracked, as we'll see, but then it finally picked up after World War II, and this is what we came to know as the Cold War. But this was a little bit early, and so there they were. But what happened was... And here we see Lenin, he passed through, Trotsky, okay, I've already told you this. And they were all financed from the West. Uh, Lenin even once wrote that apparently he finally came to realize that he was not in total control. Because he once wrote that the driver turns the wheel, but the car doesn't go the way he wants it to go. And I think he was trying to tell us that he was not in control. It's these financiers that are in control. And even in America back then when we had a better education system and a truly free and unfettered media, I think people understood this. This is a editorial cartoon from uh, 1911 and it shows George Perkins of the banker shaking hands with Karl Marx along with Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller and Teddy Roosevelt and uh, all, all these other Wall Street people, see? So they understood what was going on. We don't because we're never taught this. The ten steps that became enshrined as the Communist Manifesto, you can read them for yourself, this was the basis of, a, of socialism. Socialism is defined as the uh, control over the production and distribution um, by the public, by the people. Well, of course, nobody ever gets up in modern times and says, I want to be dictator and I'm going to tell you what to do because nobody vote for them, right? So it's always in the name of the people, communism for the people, the socialist people's republic, okay? This was later picked up by the Nazis. This was the, almost identically their platform. It was all a form of socialism. What happened was Stalin took over after Lenin died, and they began to form. He became a total tyrant. They didn't have good control over him. They uh, set up the Internationale, and the next thing you know, there were very strong communist parties in France and Italy and England, and yes, even in the United States. And the capitalists became fearful. Oh my God, they're going to take over the whole world, you know. International communism, same thing that some of you older folks, we all lived through that. That was the big boogie bear. Okay, <gasps> the communists are going to take over. Okay, and that's why we fought in Vietnam, you know, domino theory. If they take over Vietnam, the next thing you know, they'll be taking over the Philippines, then they'll take over Australia, and then they'll be on the west coast of the United States. Okay, so that was... Uh, the whole cause celebrated during most of the 20th century was to stop international communism, even though it had been started by the capitalists. And why would the capitalists start a system that was the avowed enemy of capitalism? Because if you start the whole thing and you fund it, then you control it. That's why they weren't afraid of it. But they got afraid of it when it threatened to go worldwide because they didn't want one world communism because then they couldn't control it and couldn't pit one country or economic bloc off against another. So they reached into the only country that was in a position to stop the military spread from Russia, which was Germany. 
and they found a German army intelligence agent named Adolf Hitler who was reporting back to his captain making a few extra bucks by being an intelligence operative for the German military and he said hey I infiltrated this little party called the German Workers Party and I might digress a minute to point out to you because I hear all the time I'm just one person what can I do well, let me tell you something. When Hitler went to the first meeting of the German Workers' Party that he attended, guess how many people were there? Nine. Nine people. And he took over, before long became head of the German Workers' Party, and from then on, you know what happened after that. So I don't want to hear this. I'm only one person. What can I do? Get eight friends and start doing something. All right? <laughs> So he changed the name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The National Socialistic Deutsche Arbeiter Partei, shortened to Nazi. National Socialism. This was carried on, we'll see. During the Bush administration, they, they, of course they couldn't call it National Socialism. That had bad connotations. So they called it Neoconservatism. The neocons. When you hear about the neocons, just understand we're talking about national socialist. That's what we're talking about. And Hitler then was put into power, funded through the Bank of International Settlements by Dylan Reed, the National City Bank, which, by the way, in the 30s, the chairman of National City Bank was John J. McCloy. Okay, and they were the largest lenders of money to Nazi Germany. Union Banking Corporation was another American bank out of Chicago that was very instrumental in laundering Nazi money, providing funds to the Nazis, and guess who the director of Union Banking Corporation was that was in charge of that? Prescott Bush, the grandfather of George W. Bush and the father of George Herbert Walker Bush. And in fact, in late 1942, halfway through World War II for, for America, he was actually prosecuted by the federal government of the United States under the Trading with the Enemies Act, stripped of his holdings in Union Banking Corporation and the American Hamburg Steamship Line, which, by the way, he sat on the board of directors along with Max Warburg, all right, and this, uh, the American Hamburg steamship line was the largest uh, uh, company that was bringing Nazi saboteurs, propaganda, and money into the United States. So he was stripped of his holdings and fined a few million dollars and basically slapped on the wrist, and, uh, but nothing much was said about that. Why was that? Because in the summer of 1942, Prescott Bush, who might have been an evil, money-changing Nazi financier, but he was not stupid. And he undoubtedly knew that they were looking into his business dealings. So what did he do? He was instrumental in founding the United Service Organization, the USO. And for some of you older folks who might still remember World War II, the USO was just beloved by all of the servicemen because that's where you went to get a little taste of home. That's where you went to meet girls who would serve you coffee. The USO club in, in Hollywood had the stars would come. I mean, it was a huge part of the civilian war effort. And just think about it. How could they possibly, in the middle of World War II, announce that the founder of the USO uh, was actually a Nazi financier? You know, it would have been a propaganda disaster. So that's how Prescott Bush skated uh, out from under all these charges. But uh, so they had tremendous support in the United States. And here we can see the men in the companies behind Hitler. Uh, of course, you, naturally, you'd find I.G. Farben and Zeiss, Bosch, Daimler, Ben, Siemens, Krupp, Alliance AG, the giant insurance company, which is still the world's largest insurance company today. In fact, was part of the insurers of the World Trade Center. Okay. And uh, their big claim to fame was that during World War II, they actually had insured the Nazi concentration camps against damage by the inmates who might want to tear down a fence or, you know, commit some dastardly deed. Um, 
We also see that attorneys for the Nazi Schroeder Bank, another major principal funder from Hitler, was the New York law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, and the, the lawyers that were representing the Nazis were John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, who went on to become head of the CIA. So, once Marxist socialism threatened to go worldwide, they created national socialism in Germany to try to put a stop to it. But they created another Frankenstein monster because when Hitler took over Germany in early 1933, Germany was on its knees financially. The money was in hyperinflation. You all remember the stories. They had to have a whole wheelbarrow load of money just to buy a loaf of bread. Half the population was out of work. They were just, they were in dire straits. Within two years, by 1935, Germany was booming. Why? Because Hitler started public works projects like the Audubon and building buildings and all like that. And he did not borrow interest-bearing money from the international bankers. He created his own money through the Deutsche Bank, the Reichsbank, and interest-free money. And that's why they then decided, after creating Hitler and the Nazis, they decided they had to stop him. Winston Churchill laid it out when he said, you must understand that this war is not against Hitler or National Socialism, but against the strength of the German people, meaning the economic strength of the German people, which must be smashed once and for all, regardless of whether it's in the hands of Hitler or a Jesuit priest. They didn't care who was in charge. They actually liked National Socialism, as we will see. But Germany was becoming too powerful, and the, the financial wizards in the city of London and in Wall Street did not want Germany leading the world economic order. So they had to pool the resources of 26 nations to stop Hitler. And now that leads us to the rise of the Fourth Reich. And that's uh, another book I have. Uh, you might find that at your local bookstore. This is The Nazification of America. And it starts by debauching the money. You now have the Federal Reserve System, uh, which is America's central bank. Early on, they said we must never refer to it as a central bank. And now, uh, about starting about 10, 15 years ago, all of a sudden in the news in the United States, they just said, the central bank today announced raising and interest rates, blah, blah, blah. And they just started referring to it as the central bank. And we're so dumbed down, drugged out, we said, oh, oh, the central bank, okay. Don't even know the history and the debates that have taken place about it. And what has this central bank done for us? Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal Bur uh, Fed's Board of Governors, was asked about the Great Depression of the 1930s, and he said, well, yeah, you're right, we did it. We're really sorry. We're, we're going to try to do better. So they have admitted that they engineered the Great Depression of the 30s. In 2009, when he was asked by, before a congressional committee what happened to $500 billion in U.S. tax-backed credit swaps to foreign banks, he says, I don't know. <laughs> Jeez, I had it when I came in. <laughs> And then pressed on it, he said, well, I really can't tell you because that's privileged information. Because the Federal Reserve System is neither federal nor does it have any reserves. It is a privately operated operation. The 12 Federal Reserve Banks are owned by private banks, which in turn are owned by private investors, many of whom are not Americans. This is the international scope of the money, and if you'll check on your own Australian dollars, you'll find that it's probably the same situation. And yet, it's been the Federal Reserve that has done the credit swaps, bailouts, promoted stimulus money, trade deficits. They sent several trillion dollars over to foreign banks, and when the Congress said, well, wait a minute, who got the money? What are they using it for? This is our money. This is tax money. And what kind of collateral did we get in exchange? And Bernanke says, oh, well, I can't tell you that. Folks, that's insane. Don't let that happen in Australia. Track your money. Find out where your tax money's going. If it's going to help the little old pensioner down the road, that's great. But if it's going offshore and they won't tell you where it's going, you've got a problem.
Now, in 2000, April 2009, at the G20 conference, G20 being the 20 nations that have signed up for this economic uh, regulatory entity, they all signed on for the Financial Stability Board. Look that one up. The Financial Stability Board is supposed to regulate and coordinate all of the, the world's and the various nations' economies to make them all kind of come into line and, and operate in a similar fashion. It used to be called the Financial Stability Committee, and it was a branch of the Bank for International Settlements. Yes, that's right, the old Nazi-dominated bank. So the, now the Nazis are getting control over the money supply. Remember what Lenin said? The way to destroy the nation is debauch the money. The, federal, uh, the Financial Stability Board now governs the Federal Reserve Board, the Security Exchange Commission, Commodities Trading Commission, and several others. And under the new health care plan just passed in America, which is the most god-awful thing I've ever heard about, not that I'm opposed to health care. I think everyone deserves to have some minimal health care, but there's other ways of doing things. Early on, Barack Obama campaigned on the idea of single payer, something similar to what Britain does or Canada, okay? And yet, as soon as they started seriously talking about health care, first thing he did was say, single payer, that's off the table. We're not even going to talk about that. What a scumbag. Typical politician. You know how you can tell if a politician's lying to you? His mouth's moving. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson understood this. He said, and I sincerely believe with you that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies. And that's true. If you cut off the funds, the armies will go away. He also said that democracy will cease to exist when you take away from those who are willing to work and give to those who would not. And this has been proven true throughout history. Again, I'm not necessarily opposed to socialism. We have our own socialist programs in the United States, Medicare, okay, Social Security, and there are certain programs that need, uh, there are certain things in every country that need to be socialized so that you take care of the poor, the destitute, the, the people, you know, even Jesus said the poor are always with us, and I assure you he was not just talking about people who didn't have anything in their pocketbook, okay? There's always somebody that needs a little help, and we need to see that they're taken care of, but not in the way that these international globalists are trying to make it work. Because throughout history, it has been shown that once you have a system where the people who are working then turn over money and give it to people who are not working, before long, the people who are working go, wait a minute, I'm working my butt off. This guy is getting almost as much as I make, and he's not doing anything. I think I'll go on the dole, too. And pretty soon, the numbers of people who are working shrink, and the numbers of people who are not working grow, and then you have a real problem, because how are you going to pay for all of that? So you have to find middle ground. So to America today, we're turning into a zombie nation. All right, how can I say that? Very easy. <clears throat> zombie banks have been defined as banks whose liabilities outweigh their assets. They're dead. But they've gotten stimulus money, taxpayer-backed funds coming in to prop them up. So they're dead, they're bankrupt, but they're still going through the motions because they've got taxpayer money propping them up. Well, as a nation, America is broke. We owe, depending on who you want to listen to, between 12 and 15 trillion <coughs> dollars. And trillion, the number trillion is really hard to contemplate. I don't know how many of you all have been to Texas, but it's a big place. The distance between the Louisiana-Texas border and El Paso on the extreme western border of Texas is the same distance between El Paso and Los Angeles. It's big. In Texas, there's something like 250,000 acres. A trillion acres would represent one 3.7 million states the size of Texas. 
Think about that. It's hard to conceive of. You can't conceive of a trillion. And yet we're tossing around trillions of dollars in the newspaper all the time. Okay. So we owe between 12 and 15 trillion dollars. It's been estimated that every man, woman, and child in the United States was to divest every asset they have. They couldn't come up with more than seven to nine trillion dollars. So we're broke. But we don't know it. We keep printing money and uh, we just keep going through the motions. So we're a zombie nation. Just kind of kind of going along. And after the National Socialism, I mean the neoconservatism of Bush and the, and the uh, corruption and the problems that that was causing was beginning to wake people up. Well, then they shifted us in 2008 to the Marxist socialism of Barack Obama. Still socialism, and it's still the plan of the international financiers. To show you that there's been no change, 1989 to 1993, we had the administration of George R. Walker Bush, a Republican, and every cabinet member except for Dan Quayle, his vice president who couldn't spell potato, and his old buddy Jim Baker, and uh, Health and Human Services Secretary Louis Sullivan, every other member was a member of the Secretive Council on Foreign Relations, which is the sister organization to the uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs in Britain. This was formed right after World War I when the League of Nations idea failed because the U.S. Con uh, Senate said, we're not ready to give up our sovereignty, and they wouldn't sign on for it. So they created the Royal Institute of International Affairs in Britain and the Council on Foreign Relations in America for the express purpose of conditioning the public to accept a global governance. And today it's the United Nations, and this is what they are still pushing for. And they call themselves globalist, and they are globalist. They don't care about the United States. They don't care about England. They don't care about Australia. They don't care about any country. They are globalist. They're out to control the world. And how can they do that? Well, of course, if they say, we want to run the world, everybody's going to say, sit down and shut up. But they say, we want to bring social programs to the world. We are going to take care of you from cradle to grave. Ooh, well, that sounds pretty good. Let's go for that. What they understand, and you don't, is that any time you have a socialist program, no matter how benevolent it may be, to make it operate effectively, you've got to have central administration, central authority. And these people know they have the wealth and the power to buy up the central authority, and then what have they got? Control of the world, the oldest agenda in mankind's history. So, all of Bush's cabinet were Council on Foreign Relations people. But then, from 93 to 2000, we got the Clinton administration, a Democratic administration. Oops, all members of his cabinet, except for Defense Secretary William Perry, Council on Foreign Relations. Okay, but then we voted in a Republican administration, George W. Bush, George Bush's son, another neocon or another national socialist. Look at his ca ca cabinet. Dick Cheney, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld, Robert Gates, Elaine Chao, Christine, all counsel on foreign relations. So what's changed? Ah, uh, but now we got Barack Obama, go-go dancer in the 80s, smooth-talking young man. A man of color, a man who promises change. Whoa, and let's look at his cabinet. Oops, Robert Gates is still on there, but now he's Secretary of Defense. And we've got Janet Napolitano, Bill Richardson, Susan Rice, James Jones, Timothy Geithner, Larry Summers, all counsel on foreign relations. What's changed? Nothing. The rich party is still in power. And they're going to stay in power as long as they can control the masses. And this is why you never hear an American politician today refer to the republic. Because we are no longer a republic. We are an empire. And all they can talk about is democracy. We've got to go to Iraq and bring democracy. We've got to go to Afghanistan and assure democracy. We've got to have 
save democracy, preserve democracy. Well, what is democracy? Look in your dictionary. It's ruled by the majority. Well, that sounds good on paper, but let's look at the reality of it. What is the classic example of democracy in action? A lynch mob. They say, majority says, hang him. So they hang him. That's not what we were given. We were given a democratic republic. So what's the difference? Well, in a democratic republic, you have to go through a series of laws and checks and balances. You have to give the accused uh, legal representation. He gets to have his day in court. He gets to confront the evidence and, 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 and witnesses against him. Okay? And if he's found guilty, then he gets an appeal. And if he, the appeal's turned down, then you can hang him. That's the difference. And it's going by the wayside. The Obama health care plan, I'm just not even going into this. That's going to cost $950 billion over the next 10 years. And where is that going to come from? Because as I've already pointed out, we're broke to begin with. And I'm sure you all aren't care, don't care about the health care plan in Australia, so I'll skip on through, except I will mention that, as you well know, Obama has now nationalized and taken over the General Motors. So let me just point out that his health care plan is tantamount to demanding that every person in America buy a Chevrolet. And you say, well, I don't want a Chevrolet. And they say, well, you're going to pay for it anyway. The IRS will take it out of your... Uh, tax returns, or they'll take it out of your savings, and they're going to take it out of your bank account, so you're going to buy that General Motors car whether you want it or not. And that's what we're getting rammed down our throat in the name of health care. Plus, it's setting up a whole new level of bureaucracy. Now, in order to find out if you are actually uh, taking care of your health situation, now they can come in your home without a warrant, look all around to make sure that you're living a healthy lifestyle. It's going to get worse and worse, and it's going to get worse in Australia. They are trying to tighten screws because... I think we've got some earth changes, we've got some real environmental changes coming up, and these globalists want to make sure that they have total control now and after any of these changes. They are also taking care of us through the uh, adulteration of food and water. In America today, one of the biggest concerns, and they're right about it all the time, is obesity. Because, you know, you go to McDonald's and the, they say, thank you. No, they say, you want to supersize that? And they're going to see if you can take a double one and tr double french fries and all of this crap that they want you to eat. But it gets worse than that. Charles Elliott Perkins was a U.S. chemist who was sent to Germany at the end of World War II to try to put the IG Farben combine back together, and he wrote, the German chemists worked out an ingenious and far-reaching plan of mass control that was submitted to and adopted by the German general staff. This plan was to control the population of any given area through mass medication of drinking water supplies. In this scheme of mass control, sodium fluoride occupied a prominent place. In other words, they put fluoride in the water of the concentration camps to keep the inmates passive and non-resistant. How many of you all are drinking fluoridated water? In the United States, two-thirds of the water supply is being fluoridated. Now this is amazing because one of the most abused antidepressants in the United States today is Prozac. Prozac's technical name is fluoroxidine and it is 94 percent fluoride. So think about this. In the United States, and you all might want to check here and see if they're doing the same thing in Australia. In the United States today, if you want to take some fluoride in the form of Prozac so that you can get dulled down and you're not hyperactive and you don't have, you know, you're not looking out the window and have attention deficit disorder, uh, then you have to go to a f licensed physician and he writes you a prescription for Prozac, which is fluoroxidine, 94% fluoride, and then you can go through the day going, well, things aren't so bad. <laughs> I feel pretty good. I think I'll go take a drive. <laughs> but if you don't want to get that prescription, all you got to do is drink city water. Because then you have undocumented, non-medical people who are dumping fluoride into your water supply. And that's what's happening there. You all might want to check and see what's happening here. And then we wonder why we have had in the modern times this rash of school shootings 
and people that go crazy and teen suicides. Here's just a partial list. And what's the common denominator? If you listen to the American corporate mass media, it's guns. <gasps> guns are the problem. Folks, that's not right. I grew up in Texas. We all had guns. We took guns to school. I've taken guns to school. Nobody ever shot anybody. We, I know lots of guys had guns in the racks of their pickup trucks, right? It's not the guns. It's the drugs. It's the drugs. That's the common denominator. Every single one of these school shooters, every single one of these teen suicides, almost without exception, were either on psychoactive drugs or just coming off of psychoactive drugs, which apparently is sometimes worse than even going on them. But they won't talk about that. Why? Because... Drugs is one of the biggest corporate profit makers in the world today. In 2008, worldwide, big pharmaceutical corporations grossed more than $800 billion. $80 billion of that for psychiatric drugs, and it's growing. Uh, they're getting ready to come out with a new mental health diagnostic manual. In the 1950s, they had identified about 150 mental illnesses. In the new one, they're getting ready to come out with 375 mental illnesses, which probably requires some sort of psychiatric drug, like Prozac or Ritalin or whatever. When I was in, a kid in school, I was a voracious reader. I just read like mad. So it, even in grade school, I could read real well. So we'd be sitting in class, and we're supposed to be reading along with the class. Well, you know, I'm already a chapter ahead. So I'm a little bit bored because they're, you know, little, poor little Johnny over here is going, the fox ran through the woods. <laughs> I'm looking out the window. Oh, man, look, you know, what's happening over here? So teacher come around. And say, Jimmy, you read. No, oh, uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, come around, slap me on the wrist. Jimmy, stay with the rest of the class. Yes, ma'am. I go back a chapter, and I sit there again while they're reading throughout. Today, I would be sent to the school nurse who's been trained, conditioned, taught to tell my parents that I have attention deficit disorder, and I need to be put on Ritalin or Prozac or one of these psychiatric drugs, it's gotten completely out of hand. Now, this is not to say that I don't understand that there are a small number of people who genuinely have mental problems, and they need careful care, and they need consideration, but it's gone far beyond that. And let me show you the revolving door. This is Dr. Julie Gerberding. Throughout the Bush administration, she was director for the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. She was the one who was saying, get your vaccination. Got to have vaccination. Oh, swine flu's coming. Asian flu's coming. Bird flu's coming. Get those vaccinations. And as soon as Bush goes out of office, she resigns and becomes president of Merck Pharmaceuticals Vaccine Division. Can you spell conflict of interest? As I said last year, ooh, boy. Swine flu, look out, we're all going to die. How many of y'all took a swine flu shot? My hat's off to you. Good for you. I love this cartoon. It says, FDA-approved drug. Warning, contains FDA-approved drugs. <laughs> this goes back to a little admonition that was a scratch on the walls of the Roman... Colosseum thousands of years ago says, who will watch the watchers? We have the Federal Drug Administration. I'm sure you have something comparable. And yet, what are you going to do about that? Because it's a revolving door. Now, what's this all about? It's about depopulation. Prince Philip says, human population growth is probably the single most serious long-term threat to survival, and if it isn't controlled voluntarily, it will be controlled involuntarily by an increase in disease, starvation, and war. 
Well, okay, now, if you try to give him all due credit, you could say, well, he's just warning us that that's what's going to happen if we don't voluntarily try to take care of overpopulation. But, folks, that's not it. Because I have other interviews with Maxwell Taylor, with uh, other people ranking Council on Foreign Relations members, and they make it very clear that they want to reduce the human population. And even Prince Philip finally let the cat out of the bag when he said, in the event that I am reincarnated, I'd like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. They want to kill us. They want to kill us. So, to try to understand about the New World Order and to contest the New World Order, this is not just political activism. Folks, this is self-defense. Because what used to be called eugenics, it kind of fell into disrepute because Hitler and the Nazis carried it to its logical extreme. Well, we got some people here, and it wasn't just the Jews. It was the gypsies. It was the intellectuals. It was dissidents. It was Freemasons. It was, you know, psychic people. You know, anybody that they thought was in a position to give them a hard time, they just sent them to the camps. And then they thought, well, you know, we got all these people to feed and clothe. That's, you know, it's costly and kind of a hassle. So let's just do away with them. And they did. So that brought eugenics into disrepute. Although the eugenics movement actually started in the United States with the Harrimans and the Rockefellers. California was, uh, they were, uh, a sterilizing women back at the, at the turn of the 20th century. Hitler just simply took what we were doing and, and carried it a few steps further. And they're still doing it today, thanks to chemtrails. Are you all familiar with chemtrails? Do you know that they're dumping? On, what are they dumping on you? Uh, aluminum oxide, uh, barium, pathogens. Vaccinations. They're telling you, you got to take these vaccinations. And I don't know about here in Australia, but last year everybody took the, or the dummies took this round of vaccinations. And then they came on the media and said, well, you know, that really wasn't quite doing the job. I think it's mutated. So you need to go back and get another shot. And, you know, get vaccinated too. Uh, genetically modified foods. Dump that. And you know the proof of that is, uh, do you all know about the Global Seed Vault in Spitsbergen, Norway? Some of you do. They have drilled into a granite mountainside and created a hermetically sealed vault, and they are storing every known seed that's known to man. And the sponsors of this are the Rockefeller Foundation, Bill Gates, who himself says vaccinations are the key to overpopulation. And in the, in the, in that a great play on words because a lot of people hear him on television saying this and they think, oh, what a great guy. He wants us to all get vaccinated and so we'll all live a long time and we'll all be happier. They don't understand that Bill Gates understands about the vaccinations. It depletes your immunization system. You'll die off faster and the world will be a happier place because there'll be fewer people. All right. And so you got Bill Gates, Rockefeller Foundation, Monsanto. But here's the kicker. Is Monsanto storing away their genetically modified seeds? No. They're only storing away the natural and recurring seeds. So that shows that they understand that their GMO seeds are terrible. And, of course, fluoridation. And if you think this isn't a plan, stop and consider, and you'll read about this in my new book. To date, there are more than 100 microbiologists around the world, primarily in Britain, United States, Canada. I can't recall if there was any in Australia who have died under unusual circumstances just in the past few years. These are people who could tell us what pandemics are real and what pandemics are false. These are the people who might even come up with a solution. All right, 9-11. War in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, curtail liberties, and it's all based on 9-11. NORAD successfully scrambled interceptors within 15 minutes from alert, 129 times in 2000. They did it 67 times between September 2000 and June 2001, yet on the morning of September the 11th, they couldn't accomplish this practice task four times. 
What's wrong with that picture? Here's a photograph of Ground Zero taken before any of the cleanup crews moved in. Where's the concrete? Where is the concrete? The government says that these two 110-story buildings should have produced four and a half million tons of debris stacked up to about 10 stories. The same government then tells us they hauled away one and a half million tons of debris that had stacked up to only about two stories. What happened to the other three million tons of debris? No explanation. Here's building seven. <laughs> 47-story steel reinforced building. It was not hit by any airplanes, and yet at 5.30 that afternoon it just drops, and most of the time you never heard about this. And yet Silverstein, the owner, on PBS in 2002 said, well, we've had such a terrible loss of life, maybe the smartest thing to do is pull it. So they made the decision to pull it, and we watched the building collapse. Well, pull it is industry slang for a controlled demolition of the building. And, of course, then they tried to deny that. Uh, a spokesman for Silverstein says, no, no, we, he was talking about pulling the firemen out of the building. Well, that's horse pucky because the firemen had been pulled out of the building at 1030 that morning. There were no firemen in it. In April 2010, this Jeffrey Shapiro wrote a piece for Fox News and called 9-11 theorist uh, paranoid, delusional, pack of lies. And yet, in his story, he said, based on the notes he made that day, that the uh, New York Police Department and Con Edison workers told him that Silverstein had been on the phone with his insurance character, uh, carrier to see if they would authorize the controlled demolition of the building. Well, that takes care of his excuse, saying he wasn't talking about a controlled demolition. Of course he was, and it came down. <coughs> Boom. <coughs> Boom. Controlled demolition. Here is an aerial shot of Building 7 in the circle, and here uh, is the, uh, the Verizon building over here, and over here is the United States Post Office. Look at that. It fell right in between them and really didn't even damage. Seriously, those two buildings. That, my friends, is a controlled demolition. And notice how the walls are all fallen in this way, this way. It was a building demolition. Here is the Windsor Hotel in Spain, which in uh, early 2008 burned out of control for two days, totally gutted the building, but oops, look, didn't fall down. There's never been a modern steel reinforced building that's collapsed due to fire. And this is the one I love. Here is reporter Jane Stanley for BBC reporting live that the 47-story Salman Brothers building uh, close to the World Trade Center has also collapsed, and yet, see the era? That's Building 7. It was still standing. <laughs> they got off their script just a little bit, about 30 minutes too soon. And yet they tell us that they had no idea it was going to collapse. Give me a and here's some other stuff which I'll skip on through, but this is very interesting. The explosion you see here on the right, that's the South Tower, the first one to collapse. Here's the North Tower. It's still standing. This is Building 6, which should be protected by the North Tower. And yet, look, it's already burned, scorched. Something's already happened to that. We have not been told the truth of 9-11. Here you can see that heavy steel beams, girders being thrown three and four hundred feet into the air. How does that happen with a building that's simply collapsing? What causes these cars to be scorched blocks away from those buildings? What burned them? I thought it was just a building falling down. What flipped this car upside down? I thought it was just a building falling down. How's a building falling down a few blocks away flip a car upside down? What scorched these parking meters along Barclay Street? They said there were 30 of them all bent over at a 30 degree angle and their, their heads scorched and burned. What caused that? Not just a collapsing building. This is a good one. Look, these are steel girders that are sticking up in the air. This is all part of a film that was taken. And look, they don't fall over. They just disintegrate. What disintegrates steel? And we see the pyroplasmic cloud of the Trade Center as it explodes. And I say explodes because look at how it explodes upward at the top as well as exploding over. Oops, it looks very, very similar to an atomic explosion out in the desert. Now here's the clincher. You've got to follow the money. 
I hate to say this, but at its most basic point, 9-11 was an insurance scam. The Twin Towers, which were built on Rockefeller land and early on were dubbed the David and the Nelson, were eyesores to most New Yorkers. They thought it broke up their beautiful skyline. They really never did like those towers. The towers were never completely filled. They were a money-losing proposition from the get-go. By going into 2010, they had a real problem. They were 30 years old. They were starting to deteriorate. They were owned by the Port Authority of New York. The Port Authority had already sought permission from the city of New York to tear the buildings down, and then they found out that they were half filled with asbestos. Oops, they couldn't tear them down. So two months before 9-11, Larry Silverstein and Wakefield Properties secured a 99-year lease on the World Trade Center for, uh, for a total of uh, $3.2 billion, okay? But they didn't pay that money out right away. In fact, the only money that came out of their pocket was about $124 million um, to begin with. And then they did two things. First, they hired a company called Securicom to provide security for the World Trade Center companies. Securicom uh, was uh, headed by Wirt Walker III, as in George Herbert Walker Bush, okay, part of the Bush family, and sitting on the board of directors was Marvin Bush, George W.'s youngest brother. So the Bushes had control over the security of the World Trade Center. Next thing Silverstein did was go to insurance companies and obtain insurance, separate insurance policies on the World Trade Center with the specific demand, and they accepted it, that they would pay off in the event of a terrorist attack. Now, I challenge you to go to your insurance carrier and see if they will insure your house against terrorist attack. No, they won't because they can't qualify it. They can't guarantee what's going to happen there. All right. So these insurance companies, by the way, were not state farm insurance. This was Alliance, Swiss Re, these giant world-class insurance companies, which now puts it into the hands of leading globalists who attend these Bilderberg meetings. We're at that level, and now you understand why you may never learn the truth about 9-11. Two months later, boom, planes hit the World Trade Center, reportedly, and down they come. Larry Silverstein goes to court and says, well, there were two planes, hit two buildings. That's double indemnity. Uh, you know, I want $16 billion. And the insurance companies argued with him, and they fought for less than a year. And they finally ended up awarding him $4.6 billion for a $124 million investment. And I guess the Port Authority felt sorry for him because they refunded his $124 million. <laughs> Not a bad investment. Total profit, $4.6 billion. But he doesn't get to keep all that. Uh, the mortgage holders got a portion of that money, and the largest mortgage holder in the World Trade Center was Blackstone Group, whose CEO is Peter G. Peterson, who I'm sure by just some coincidence, head of the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. So now you see at the level that the money flowed on that deal, and this is why you're never going to learn the truth of it. Quickly we turn to the Pentagon. Something blew up at the Pentagon. But look at this picture. The walls are bowed outward, not pushed inward. Something blew up inside the Pentagon. And here's the one picture that you've probably never seen. This is the hole in the west side of the Pentagon before the wall collapsed. And as you can see for yourself, it's only about 10 to 12 foot high, and it's, only, it's less than 20 foot wide. And as you can also see, uh, there's some fire going on here. These windows appear to be intact. These windows appear to be intact. And this car, even though it's scorched on one side and damaged, the paint, white paint's still good. Uh, wait a minute. How does a aircraft with a 125-foot wingspan, two two-ton titanium steel jet engines, and a four-story high tail fit through this little bitty hole? And, by the way, I interviewed a woman named April Gallup who crawled through this hole to escape with her small child. And they said, oh, the plane buried itself in the building and just blew up and there was such an intense fire, it just melted the whole plane. And it just went away. Well, if that's the case, how come she's still alive? 
Here's what a plane crash looks like, and I've been to many of them. Usually the tail breaks off, so you have an intact tail section. Wings will break off. You can usually find an intact wing, and you always have the uh, engine because they're made with titanium steel blades, and they don't burn, and they don't do anything. They just lay there. Well, now, here's the Pentagon prior to the wall collapsing. Where's the airplane? Where's the tail assemblies? Where are the wheel assemblies? Where's anything? It's not there. And here's finally then the wall collapses. And again, where's the airplane? It's just green grass over here. And here's what I love. Now the wall collapses and we find that everything looks clean and bright on the inside. Here's a wooden table with a book on it. Here's a wooden desk. Here's a plastic computer monitor. Where's that giant fire? In fact, this is how stupid they think we are. They first they said the plane exploded in a fire and it burned up everything. All the whole plane was just, you know, reduced to nothing, uh, immolated by the fire. And then a few weeks later they said, but we have identified the victims by their fingerprints. <laughs> what? <laughs> I interviewed a Sergeant Lauro Chavez of the Central Command, and he said that morning they were doing war game exercises, and one of the exercises was a hijacked airplane being crashed into the World Trade Center. And when they heard that this was actually happening and they switched on CNN and they saw the North Tower burning, said their jaws hit the floor. They said, how could this happen? How could, how could something we're programming and as an exercise actually happened in real life. And as part of the exercise, he said they were putting false images on the FAA radar screens, 22 to 24 inputs representing hijacked airplanes on the FAA radar. They didn't know what was real and what wasn't. And when they first contacted NORAD and said, have you got interceptors in the air, the first question was, well, is this the real world or is this the exercise? That's how they confused the whole thing. And who would have known about that? Who could have, how did the hijackers know to coincide their attack with the war game exercises? Then we get the 9-11 omission, I mean commission report, full of omissions, 125 more omissions. For example, how did the 9-11, the official 9-11 Commission, how did they explain the collapse of Building 7? They didn't. They didn't even mention it. How's that for investigation? And to show you what a penny investigation it was, total cost of the 9-11 investigation was $13 million. First off, they dragged their feet for two years until the families finally pressured President Bush into appointing a commission to find out what had happened on 9-11, and he funded them for $3 million. They couldn't even take that. They said, hey, we can't do this for $3 million, so he reluctantly upped it another $10 million, and it ended up costing $13 million to investigate the worst terrorist attack on the American soil in history. And yet, in 2004, according to the Republican National Committee, they spent $60 million, four times more, on inauguration festivities for George W. Bush. So you can see what was more important. 3,000 American lives and the largest terror attack are parties for George W. Bush. So we know a lot now, and it's all in my book, The Terror Conspiracy. Now, it was an inside job. Well, I've always been asked, so where's the proof? One, here's one proof. The senior counsel to the 9-11 Commission, John Farmer, last year published a book, and he wrote, in the course of our investigation of the national response to the attacks of 9-11, the Commission staff discovered that the official version of what had occurred, that is, what government and military officials had told Congress, the Commission, the media, and the public about who knew what and when, was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue. That's their own senior counsel. He says, there was an agreement at some level of government at some point in time, there was an agreement not to tell the truth about what happened. So, folks, I ask you, if they're on, the senior counsel of the 9-11 Commission, and by the way, the two directors, too, uh, Keene and, and Hamilton, they both have expressed uh, questions and doubts about their own conclusion. Well, if the people who are in charge of the own government investigation says it's untrue and we have doubts about it, then why am I a conspiracy theorist trying to raise questions about what happened to 3,000 of my fellow countrymen? <laughs> and
And finally, we have the Open Chemical Physics Journal of 2009, which published in uh, Holland, I believe. And in a peer-reviewed scientific paper, they concluded that in all samples of the World Trade Center debris, they found traces of an unreacted thermetic material incorporating nanotechnology in its highly energetic pyrotechnic or explosive material, thermite and its nanotechnology counterpart, Thermate, which is a, uh, a military-controlled explosive only obtainable through the U.S. military. There's the proof. And yet, no American who watches TV or reads the New York Times or the Washington Post has ever seen this. It has not been reported on. So, what do we do? The reason we don't know anything is because the media in the United States is now under control of five corporations. Time Warner, Disney, Vivendi, Viacom, News Corporation, which is your own Rupert Murdoch, and Bertelsmann, the Nazi printer that was the largest publisher of Nazi propaganda to the German army during World War II, and they now are the largest publisher in the English language. My book, new book, the trillion dollar conspiracy for the first time in my experience I've had some canceled on me very mysteriously but for the first time I was actually censored I was on a phone conference with my senior editor luckily my agent was on the phone overheard everything my senior editor said I did not contract for this section I want you to take it out and I said no I, th I think it's important people understand this and know this it's fully sourced there's no legal problem with it he said well let me put it this way if you don't take it out I won't publish the book and what section do you want me to take out the section about how corporate media censors the news <laughs> so I said you kind of proved my point didn't you and he tries to argue with me saying, oh, no, no, if I don't let you publish something, that's not censorship. It's only if you publish something and we don't distribute it. And I said, pardon my French, you're full of shit. <laughs> the other thing they took out was the two million man march. Tea Party, September the 12th, 2010, an estimated two million Americans marched on Washington. Okay demonstrating against Obama's bailouts and against the health care plan. It was not reported on. Another thing they took out was the... I'm sorry? Oh, that's my fault. It was 2009. I was, I was doing this slide in 2010. I've, I've corrected it somewhere else, but I didn't correct it here. Mia culpa, I'm sorry. It was, it was September the 12th, 2009. Never mind my title. Interlocking boards of directors. That shows who's actually controlling the media. They took that out. They also took out a false picture of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda means literally the base. And early on, I thought, well, it must refer to their headquarters somewhere. And yet, Robin Cook, former leader of the British House of Commons, said bin Laden was armed by the CIA, funded by the Saudis, to wage jihad against the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda, literally the base, was originally the computer file or base of thousands of Mujahideen who were recruited, trained to help the CIA to defeat the Russians. So in other words, Al-Qaeda is actually refers to the CIA database that they can draw on for mercenary Arabs to do whatever they pay them to do. The whole war on terrorism is a fraud. I haven't got time to go into it, but the explosions in Madrid, the bombings in London, 9-11, these were all false flag operations carried out by paramilitary organizations to create the idea that there is this huge international, you know, Al-Qaeda terrorist group intent on slipping weapons of mass destruction into the United States. Well, folks, I'll simply ask you this. If that's true, then how come they have not done the one common sense thing, which is to secure the borders? of the United States. They haven't done it. They still haven't done it. 
and we're still having problems. They could, they could march a battalion of terrorists in through the sieves that we call the southern border and Canadian border of the United States. If they were serious about an international terrorist group, they would tighten up the borders, but they haven't done it in the, yet and haven't done it now. Another thing they took out, haven't got time to get into this, but the tantalizing evidence that Barack Obama is a young Muslim male who spoke several foreign languages, including Farsi, raised in Indonesia. Uh, he was a perfect recruit for the CIA. This explains how he's able to travel to Pakistan when no American with an American passport could get into Pakistan, and how he was able to move all around, how he's able to suddenly show up at Harvard with no particular academic background, and why he went to Columbia and said he was so popular and did so many great things at Columbia, and yet they interviewed 400 people in his class at Columbia, and not one of them even remembered him being there. And of course, his school records and his birth certificate are still sequestered, kept from the public, and this is because it would have shown that he was a legend, a creation of the CIA. But I can't say that. The top censored stories of 2009, that was censored out too. So the rest of the thing I have is things that Americans can do to try to remedy the situation. And I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to make it real quick. First, we have to rescind these presidential orders that keep secret and classified the papers of former presidents. How can they do that? This was pushed through by George W. Bush to protect his father, but Obama's gone along with it. He, too, says you can't look at their papers. Well, how do we know what our leaders are doing if we can't look at their papers? Federal Reserve System, we need to at least audit it, if not abolish it. We need to uh, remove Congress from the special federal employee retirement system and put them on Medicare and Social Security and watch how fast they clean it up. But they're not, they're not under that. No one who has ever served as an intelligence agent, whether military or civilian, should ever allow to be president, prime minister, or, or chief executive of any country because they've been brought up in a whole culture where deceit is the name of the game. You don't want that. No, prohibit any intelligence people from serving you as a leader. Lobbyist. Right now, there are probably five to ten lobbyists for every congressman in the United States. There should only be a, there should be a law that says only one lobbyist can go and talk to with a congressman at any one time, any representative. And when they go, they should be accompanied by a public advocate who goes with them to argue the case for the public. That might help some things. We need to curtail the lifelong judges on the Supreme Court and while we're at it we need to curtail the limits of senators and politicians who should not be in there. In America they're not supposed to be permanent professional politicians. They're supposed to be citizens who go up and devote a year or two or three or four to serving as a representative of their public and then return to the private sector. Instead, they go up there, stay there for life. Ted Kennedy's a good example. But of course, the problem is that any of these reforms is going to require an act of Congress. Are they going to vote themselves to reduce their salaries, to put themselves on Medicare or Social Security, to put themselves and reduce their own uh, tenures in office? No. So what do we do? I'm hoping, and we're, there's a lot of people pushing, this year in November, we vote them all out. And you all might consider that. If you get tired of what your parliament's doing here in uh, Australia, vote them all out. Yeah, you're going to lose a few good ones. You're going to lose the bad ones. You're going to lose some in-between ones. But if you vote them all out one time, then you have shown them that you're boss, and maybe they'll start listening to you. And, of course, in America, we have a real problem because, to paraphrase Stalin, Stalin he says, I don't really care how you, anyone votes. I only care who counts the votes. And we have a real problem with electronic voting machines, and I'm not sure what the situation is here, but if you have electronic voting machines, you need to get rid of those because there's no paper trail and you have no guarantee that your vote is being counted. Need to return to paper ballots. Need to establish a, a real education system. Um, 
no secret society members should belong to Congress or to your parliament because they take oaths of allegiance that supersede their oaths to their country and to you. We need to do away with the Patriot Act, which is nothing more than just an updated version of Hitler's Enabling Act. And we need to have no more cover-up commissions. And we need to enforce the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, which states that anything that is not uh, power that is not specifically delegated to the federal government belongs to the people in the states. But let me tell you where we are, folks, and you're not hearing anything about this, but it's going to get worse. In Tennessee, they have passed a law that said if you own a firearm in Tennessee and it's not going out of the state or it's made in Tennessee, then you are exempt from federal firearms laws and regulations. Because the only reason that the federal government got involved in firearms was through a little clause in interstate commerce. If it's interstate commerce, then that gives the federals authorization to regulate and to pass laws. The gun dealers in Tennessee wrote to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and said, wait a minute, what, be, what, what about this? And I have seen a letter from the head of the BATF to the gun dealers in Tennessee where after blah, 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 he states, disregard the state law. So in other words, we are being turned into a central authority totalitarian state that supersedes any local representation. The same thing that the war between the states was fought about, and it's going to come to push and shove at some point. We need to uphold the Posse Comitatus Act, which says, that was passed in the 1800s, said you cannot use the military to police the civilian population. This is what police officers used to be, and I was always brought up to respect Police officers, if you have a problem, go seek out a policeman. He'll help you out. And look today. Now they're dressed in German-style helmets and body armor and carry automatic weapons, and it's more like stormtroopers. Legalized pot. Legalized marijuana. There is so many benefits we could get from this. Australia, too. Little taxation would bring in millions and millions of dollars, and it's not hurting anybody. In the United States today, it is still illegal to grow industrial hemp that has no psychoactive properties. We import our hemp. How stupid is that? And now they've even ran through uh, hate crimes. If you say something, you know, how many of you remember the childhood verse that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, okay? Who's to determine what's hate and what's not hate? Forget that. If somebody attacks someone, if somebody steals something, try them. Throw the book at them. But just because somebody is prejudiced, stupid, you know, says bad things, you know, just ostracize them. Don't pass laws about it because these laws can get out of hand real quick. And America is still the largest exporter of arms in the world. And then we talk peace. How hypocritical can you be? We need to curtail the arms industry. We need to curtail the pharmaceutical industry. Up until a few years ago, you never saw an ad on TV for drugs. And now that's just about all you see. And that's why you don't hear about the problems with drugs, because none of the media wants to antagonize their largest advertiser. Again, Codex Amilitarius, fight that. Fight that. We should be free to put use anything that we want to on ourselves. It's our own lookout. And it comes down to, are we in America a national law, or are we a lawless nation? Well, that's what the birth certificate issue is all about. It's not about Obama. It's not about race. It's not about religion. It's about do we follow the Constitution? Are we a nation of law? Or are we a lawless nation? Unfortunately, it appears that we're a lawless nation. But to keep in mind that it's, it's not fascism when we do it. And also remember, anything that's not voluntary is tyranny. And, of course, we still have some hope in the United States because, unlike Australia, we still have our guns. So get the trillion-dollar conspiracy. You'll find out what's wrong and what to do about it. And I thank you for your time. Fantastic, Jim. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to put a little rider on there in terms of Australian um, parallel situations. In some ways, we're a bit further ahead down the road than America. We've already Good. got hate crimes. 
We've already got them. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the conspiracy agendas for the future of Australia, you might want to take this aboard, when I was um, doing some chin-wagging with a guy called Peter Sawyer back in the 1980s, he was a executive level... Sorry, he was a public servant who had some um, whistleblowing activity going on, became high profile. But one of the things he put in his newsletter and told me at the time regarding the future of Australia in terms of geopolitical structures, he said... This was in the late 80s. He said the, the plan for Australia that he'd been told was we would have a strong federal government, no state governments, all the councils would merge into super councils, and that we would get a consumption tax, like a GST, which all came in. Now, I don't know whether you noticed what a lot of what Kevin Rudd did and what a lot of the Liberal Party are doing, but they're basically nationalising and taking the powers away from a lot of the states and giving it to the federal bodies. So they've, it looks good on the outside. You've got an educational curriculum, which is standardised. You've got road laws, which are standardised, counting laws, health laws. In many ways, you can see the practicalities. But one of the things a lot of people didn't twig with the mining tax that Kevin Rudd was very unpopular about was... That was a tax which took the revenue from the mining companies and gave it to the federal government. At the moment, all the revenue from mining companies goes to state governments. So keep an eye on that. Um, I was quite amazed when I saw super councils being formed and tested and being accepted. And uh, there's more of that away, so I would say that that agenda that we were told back in the 80s is the one that they're working on. And thanks, Jim, once more. Give him a hand on the way out. Thank you.